Shabnam, a very, very warm welcome to you. And I really sincerely thank you for acceding to our request to address us on a topic that I know is very, very dear to your heart. And more than that, Mumbaikas who know this area will definitely be learning some new nuggets as we go ahead this evening. On behalf of the chairperson of the CSMVS Museum, the trustees, and the Director General, Mr. Sabia Sachi Mukherjee, on my own behalf, on behalf of my executive committee and the Museum Society and all our friends from far and near who have joined us this evening, thank you so very, very much. Shabnam is a prolific writer, but before I introduce Shabnam, I'd just like to say a few words about what we are likely to hear today. For a relatively young and tiny corner of Mumbai, Kolaba plays a big role in the imagination. And in this talk, Shabnam traces the history of this tiny rocky island that has grown up to become one of the most multicultural and very colorful neighborhood in India. She also recounts the stories of a motley crew of residents and visitors from eccentric curio sellers to British prime ministers, from mango trees to stone structures that have played out against the canvas of Kolaba. A few words about Shabnam. She writes, of course, for newspapers, plays mother to three teenagers, and what does she do in her pastime? I don't know where she gets the time. I think she's made a career of it, actually, Shabnam. Devours murder mysteries and shops for saris. But her absolutely, totally, and completely favorite activities are writing books for children and seeking out ghosts, stories, and bargains in her beloved Mumbai. Her book, Kolaba, The Diamond at the Tip of Mumbai, was released earlier this year, as was her new murder mystery set in a Mumbai building during the lockdown. It's titled Murder at Daisy Apartments. Her popular books for children include The Six Spellmakers of Dorabji Street. Another one is What Maya Saw and the Laugh a Minute Nimi series. Shabnam has been a speaker at the Jaipur Literature Festival and has conducted workshops and book readings at Bukaru, the Kala Ghora Festival, the Tata Literature Life Festival, and literature festivals around the country. I don't wish to stand between you and Shabnam, but I do need to make a small announcement. I really want to thank our technical team who have been supporting us all through this lockdown for so many, many months whilst we give these lectures. And today we have under the able stewardship of Jason John, our honorary secretary and a professor at St. Xavier's and an active member of the Museum Society. We have Mrinalini, Aishwarya, Sanjana and Yashraj. Thank you very, very much for taking care of all our technical requirements. So ladies and gentlemen, relax, sit back, and we are really going to have a feast from the storyteller, Shabnam Minwala. Thank you so much, Shabnam. I hand you over to the technical team. Thank you. Hi, I'm absolutely thrilled to be here, but I have to warn you that I'm here under false pretenses. I'm not a scholar, I'm not really a researcher, and I'm not a historian. So I feel a little rattled and overwhelmed to be addressing uh, an audience connected with our venerable and wonderful museum. But here goes. Let me tell you about how I, why I'm here. I'm here because I happened to write a book on Kolaba. This was not something I really ever intended to do. For many years, I was a journalist. Then I became a mother of three, pretty much engaged in changing nappies and uh, shoving mashed potato down three unwilling mouths and uh, being grumpy about staying at home. After which I started writing books for children and became a bit cheer more cheerful. Uh, 
Now, one day I met an edit, one of my editors at a Kalaghoda cafe. And we were discussing my Nimi series, a series of books about this uh, schoolgirl named Nimi, her friendships, her, her ups, her downs, her terrible birthday, all kinds of school things. And at that point, my editor suddenly looked at me and she said, you know, we've started a series on neighborhoods around the world, wonderful neighborhoods, and we'd like you to do a book. And my immediate response was, no, not, I can't do it. I've forgotten how to be a journalist and I'm not a historian and why me? And she let me rant. And after that, she asked, if you were to do a book, which neighborhood would you focus on? So I thought about it and I said, well, I mean, if I were to do a book and there's no guarantee that I will, of course, it would have to be Kolaba. She said, done. You have eight months to deliver and I'm sending you the contract tomorrow. And I, by the time I got home, about uh, 15 minutes later, I was in a very grumpy mood. But then slowly I started thinking about it. And I started thinking about my connection with Kolaba. I am a fourth generation Kolabakar. And more than that, I am, uh, my, a lot of my imaginary life is centered around Kolaba. The first book I wrote for children, a book called The Six Spellmakers of Dorabji Street, is the story of an apartment building in Kolaba on a, in an imaginary but not really imaginary road called Dorabji Street, uh, set in a building called Kozi Castle. And in Kozi Castle live six children, two girls and four boys. And it's summer holidays. The boys are having a gala time playing cricket in a very narrow compound shouting their heads off, LBW, cheetahs never prosper, you know, the regular cricket shouting that goes on. And the two girls spend a lot of time sitting on two trees in the garden and gossiping about uh, Justin Bieber and Shah Rukh Khan and uh, life in general. Now, in the building are two rather cross old ladies, one lady named Miss Braganza, who along with her daughter runs a speech and drama class and another really nasty customer named Mrs. Kotadia. And nothing makes these two old ladies more grumpy and unhappy than the fact that the children around them are having such a gala time. And the old ladies who for years have been mortal enemies join hands and decide to make the children's life miserable. And they decide to cut down the two bimbli trees in the garden. And that is when the children decide they have to save the trees somehow or the other. They approach the BMC with the help of their parents. The BMC is not very forthcoming. The police are unwilling to help. And finally, the children turn to magic and find a spell to summon fairies. And a number of unusual characters enter their world. I leave, I've left it up to the readers to figure out whether those are really fairies or just unusual individuals who've waltzed into the lives of the children and the great battle begins. Kolaba, ironically, is also the backdrop of my latest book, Murder at Daisy Apartments, which is set in two sealed buildings during the lockdown. And a teenager named Nandini Venkat is sitting in Lily Apartments because there's not much to do in a sealed building. She keeps peering. Change going on in the stairwell of Daisy Apartments, which is also sealed. She doesn't think much about it till a few days later, it transpires that the chairperson of Daisy Apartments, a gentleman, a not very pleasant gentleman named Baman Marker has been murdered. At which point Nandini starts playing detective. The, the wonderful part about writing this book on Kolaba, I think, was that when I jumped in, I realized that reality and history can throw many more stories and surprises than the world of fiction. And I think that my book in, on Kolaba is surprisingly packed with stories which are, to me, more precious than anything that I have conjured up in my head. And I think at this point, I'm going to do the really terrifying thing of starting to share my screen. Fingers crossed, it will all go well. So I thought that before I began, I would give you all a little taster about Kolaba because so many of us have not really left our houses for so many days. So just to refresh our memory about this neighborhood and introduce those who are not so familiar with Kolaba to the neighborhood. So it's just a tiny...
I, I think that very soon when I started uh, doing research on Kolaba, I got the two biggest surprises of, of my investigation. Um, and I think all of us, when we grow up, know two facts about the history of Mumbai, Bombay. We know that it was seven islands at one point, and we know that it was part of the dowry that Catherine Braganza's family gave to Charles II. Uh, when I started the book on Kolaba, I started with this, the first and very basic question, what exactly is Kolaba? And of course, I went to all the usual sources. I went to the municipality. I spoke to the police. I tried the post office. But I realized that all these agencies uh, have, were more interested in convenience rather than local history. And their view of Kolaba was completely different from anything that I had in mind. And then it struck me, let me go back to the past. I mean, how difficult can it be? We all know that Bombay was seven islands. If Bombay is seven islands, all I have to do is sort of excavate under the cement and the buildings and the taxis and the traffic and find the island of Kolaba. So at that point, um, I started uh, reading up on the seven islands. And we all, of course, know the seven islands, the three northern islands, the marshy island of Parel, the island of Mahim, already prosperous with important religious monuments. Um, Worli, which was a very rocky place with rough seas surrounding it. And then the big H-shaped island of Bombay, right in the middle. Uh, to the side of that was Moscow. And then the two little islands, Old Woman's Island and Kolab. Now, how to find out where exactly Old Woman's Island and Kolaba were? I started looking at maps. And at first, I was very comfortable because the first map I looked at was the map of what? Of uh, Bombay in the 1670s. And that was this very familiar map that we've all seen where Bombay looks like a, a little, like a few blobs of anima, of amoeba, tiny islands that around, a sort of a rickety skeleton around which the city grew. So I thought, okay, now I'm going to extrapolate it and see where Kolaba fits compared to our modern city. But I started looking at a few more maps and that is when I got really startled because the next map I looked at was a map drawn by a doctor called John Fryer in 1672. So that was just two years later than this 1670s map. And the map of that Dr. Fryer had drawn, if you look at it, it's an extremely different map because Bombay is shown as a big fat blob with a little tail, which is Old Woman's Island and Kolaba. And then but he talks about seven islands, but the seven islands are not the seven islands that we know. He talks about the island of Putachos, which uh, it is uh, now called Butcher's Island. Uh, and... Uh, the island of Henry Kennery and Munchambe and very unfamiliar names. So I was really, really startled. Anyway, I thought, what does John Fryer know? He was only a doctor with the East India Company and he should have stuck to curing malaria and cholera. So I started looking at more maps, but the strange thing was that almost all the maps, old maps drawn by the British depicted Bombay as one big fat blob. And it really, really puzzled me. I think it took a lot of research before I realized the truth of the matter. And the, ma the truth of the matter lies in the history of the city. In 1661, when the royal marriage took place, there was a lot of bargaining between the British and the Portuguese. I mean, sort of, it was like a huge multinational merger that took place. Uh, king Charles II was uh, a poor king, but a king with very expensive tastes. And he wanted a rich bride, but he was also fussy. So a whole lot of princesses were paraded before him and he rejected them all as being unappealing. He finally agreed to uh, the Portuguese princess. Probably a lot of pressure was put on him at that point. And there was a lot of bargaining. The Portuguese agreed to give this big fat dowry. At one point, the British were buying for all of Goa, but that didn't happen. And finally, they created this package which included Tangiers and Bombay. And there is, the British really didn't know what they were in for. And there is a very famous quote by Lord Clarendon, gloating that they have got the island of Bombay with its forts and towns, and that the island of Bombay is just next to Brazil. 
uh, now in 1662, Abraham Shipman uh, came with 400 men to take control of Bombay. It was a really ill-fated uh, expedition. Firstly, the ship in which Abraham Shipman was got lost. So when the, the remaining British arrived in Bombay, they were in for a rude shock. Bombay was already properly occupied by a lot of uh, families, Portuguese families, who enjoyed the fact that they were lords of their own man manners and they were very reluctant to hand over to the British just because two people far away had decided to get married. And they were putting every possible obstruction in the way. Uh, among the, so they said, we won't hand over to anybody but shipmen. Finally, shipmen arrived. Then they said, show us the maps. But in the process, King, King Charles had managed to lose the map. So again, there were problems on the way. They wouldn't allow shipmen and his men to enter Bombay. And shipmen and his men were sent off to an island of Karnataka and made to wait over there. Um, over time, though, uh, in about a couple of years, uh, only 140 men remained. The remaining all died because of uh, um, the ill health and making merry in too, uh, too rash a way, I guess. Too much intemperance, according to the books. Anyway, they, uh, then Shipman died. Luckily for the British, Shipman had a very wily and clever secretary called Humphrey Cook. And Humphrey Cook was a much tougher customer. And he managed to properly bargain with the British. And he finally, finally managed two years later to enter, put a foot into Bombay. And he made a great show of entering Bombay. He entered the fort, held the, the earth, picked up uh, sort of clumps of mud and held them to himself and prayed over it. But the problems didn't end there. Because there was this huge question of what is Bombay? Now, the Portuguese said that Bombay was just that middle eight shaped island. And the British said, no way. Bombay includes Mahim and Farel and Worli. As it is, they were a bit disappointed by Bombay, which they had realized was a very tiny place and not very wealthy. All it had was rice and coconuts and fish. And so they were hell bent on getting the northern islands as well. Now, Humphrey Cook defined an island. He said an island is a place that you cannot walk to by foot. And he proceeded to walk from the eight-shaped island of Bombay to Mahim and to all the other islands. He could do this only in low tide because the areas that divided the islands were not exactly sea and were not exactly land. They were a sort of a swamp which, during high tide, filled the entire, the water, water filled the spaces. During low tide, it receded. So you could go on foot during low tide, but at high tide, you needed boats. So Cook cleverly waited for low tide and walked from one place to another and then announced, I'm sorry, I can walk. This is all ours. The Portuguese were furious and they kept pointing out that they needed boats, but Cook finally got his way. And that is how the, the Northern Islands uh, came to the British. In all of this wrangling, it was uh, only uh, the two islands of two islands, Old Woman's Island and Kolaba, that nobody sort of questioned their island status. They were very clearly islands. The pity was that nobody really wanted them because they were extremely tiny and sort of unimpressive places. And uh, the, the crown didn't see the point of uh, battling with, uh, with uh, the Portuguese. And the Portuguese didn't see the point of holding on to them. So slowly over time, there was a quiet little treaty and the Portuguese handed over these two unimpressive little islands, Old Woman's Island and Kolaba. If you can see in this slide, there you can see the little tale of Old Woman's Island and Kolaba. So in a, in a sense, when I read the story, I think a lot of the preconceived notions that we have about Bombay the fact that it is seven islands and the fact that it was the dowry, you know, it jolted my notions because I realized that there were so many stories behind the, the bland facade that we learn in school. The sort of the easy facts that appear in quiz competitions and in, on Wikipedia. And now my question then was, what exactly is Kolaba? I was still hunting. 
after reading a lot of old books, I realized that Kolaba was actually very, very much to the tip of the city. And the Kula island of Kolaba extended more or less from Prong's lighthouse uh, at the very tip that you can see from US Club and from the tip of Nariman Point up to just Sasun Dock. At the north of Sasun Dock, there was a small stream that flowed. And that is what divided Kolaba and Old Woman's Island. And Old Woman's Island was a tiny triangular sort of protruding rock or hillock, which had a village where, where it is estimated that that is where Kolaba Bazaar is now. There was a proper village over there. And that extended up to uh, the police station. Kolaba police station on Kolaba Causeway. And in fact, if I don't know if any of you have actually stepped into Kolaba police station, but if you go all the way in, there is a little mandir. And beyond the mandir, there is a little bit of land that has been encroached, amazingly enough, in a, in a police station compound by a family called the Shirsagars. And if you have the courage to go and peer into the Shirsagars gate, there is a little stone. Um, there, which they have, the Shirsagars have unfortunately painted blue. And on that stone is the legend that states that this is where the ferry that runs from the old woman's island to the island of Bombay began. So it is actually at the point of Kolaba police station that people would catch the ferry and the ferry would then cross up to Bombay, the island of Bombay, which essentially was where museum stands now. And the director general of police, his office is uh, uh, situated. Uh, so, um, unfortunately, the Shirsagars are very unfriendly about allowing you to go and look at the stone. They get rude, they get angry, and tend to shoo most of us away. But, in a sense, one of Bombay's and Kolaba's oldest landmarks sits behind a closed gate under blue paint and a gunny sack and drying uh, lingerie uh, and tells us a story of the city. Now, we know very, very little really about Bombay till the 1700s. What do we know? We know that for a long time, the seven islands were sort of slumbering in the ocean uh, while uh, uh, the, the coast, the Konkan was changing hands. And as different kingdoms ruled the Konkan, they ruled Bombay as well. But it's unlikely that any of the kings or princes bothered too much bothered even to visit the quiet and uh, sleepy islands under them. Uh, why, and uh, there are historians which talk about the islands slumbering in the bosom of the Arabian Sea and watching probably enviously while the ships carry wonderful riches from Babylon to Sopara and from Mesopotamia to Chol. Well, the tables have turned. And now Sopara is Nala Sopara, Chol is a little village and Bombay is Bombay, Mumbai. Anyway, in the mid 1500s, uh, the Nawab of, uh, of Gujarat this was having a few spats with Humayun. And he sort of jumped from the frying pan into the fire rather foolishly and decided to uh, tie himself up to the Portuguese and signed the sort of a treaty. And a lot, the treaty was largely uh, that he would hand over Basin and its protectorates, and Bombay went along with that to the Portuguese. Not much happened. The Portuguese divided up Bombay and probably bits of Kolaba and Old Woman's Island and gave it to the sort of uh, wealthier families for a rent, and the families were having a gala time, a happy time in this city of good life. Uh, and Bombay was an extraordinarily beautiful city at that point. Now, uh, in the, uh, around the 1600s, the British first started uh, arriving here. Uh, they would come, uh, burn things, almost in a, almost in the role of pirates and you know raiders. But they spotted the harbor of Bombay and got very greedy. They even tried to buy Bombay of the Portuguese, but the Portuguese would have none of it. So it was very fortunate for the British that two people decided to get married in England and Portugal. Anyway, so um, still, we know very little about what happened in Kolaba and um, sorry, sorry uh, we know very little about what happened in Kolaba because Kolaba was truly an outpost, a clump of rocks that nobody wanted to visit. 
it is that fortunate for us that the East India Company had a mercenary called John Burnell. And in 1711, I think, he wrote two letters to his father. So we are fortunate that not only was he fairly an observant man, but that he was a loyal and dedicated son, and that the father was an affectionate father who stored those letters and that they have remained for posterity. So John Burnell, among the other things he did, he was also a cartographer, and he had to come and measure up Kolaba. So we, that is our first real record of Kolaba, where he describes the island of Kolaba as just two miles long and three quarters of a mile broad. And he says there's a steep hill with a few coconut trees, uh, a kiln producing limestone and tunam, and uh, mangroves. And he enters the mangroves and sees about 60 jackals. He tries to shoot them with little luck. He says they fly faster than the wind and I have been un unlucky and not able to shoot a single one. And that is sort of the image of Kolaba of do those days. We also, of course, know that there were Koli villages because that is where the name Kolaba comes from, ha the hamlet of the Kolis. Old Woman's Island, the name is a much more intriguing name, but it also has the root of, fi the, root of fisher uh, the fisher folk to it. It comes from the name Al Umani's Island, which was the Portuguese name. And uh, which, because these were the fishermen who ventured deeper into, this, into the Arabian Sea, the deep water fishing, so went further towards Oman. And the British, in their usual sort of tongue twisted manner, converted it to Old Women, Woman's Island and then started imagining that the name was connected with a mother of harlots and a goddess, uh, you know, a terrifying goddess and a, an old Portuguese name. But no, unfortunately, the, the etymology of the name is much more ordinary, which is quite sad. <laughs> anyway, so this is what we know about Kolaba. The story of Kolaba of the 1700s, unfortunately, is connected with, is, uh, has a fairly sort of a grisly air about it. Because the other part about Kolaba that everyone remarked about was a point called Mendham's Point. Now, Mendham's Point was the most infamous cemetery in all of the British Empire. It was insatiable. From the middle of the 1600s, when the British started coming regularly, the climate and the general uh, lifestyle of, the, people, of the, the English soldiers when they arrived here was, uh, was such that, uh, according to a chaplain called John Ovington, the, the, life, uh, the lifespan of a man in Bombay was two monsoons. And he has described Bombay as a place full of illness and sin and towards the size of ducks. So <laughs> clearly he wasn't very fond of the place. And this may partly be because he came on a ship uh, in the 1600s and within two months, 35 of his shipmates had been buried at Mendham's point. So that could color his view, I imagine. Um, uh, he, he, Mendham's, every traveler who came to Bombay described Mendham's point and so did John Burnell. John Burnell, as ships approached the Bombay port, Mendham's Point was the first thing you could see. And there were 140 tombs. Some were very impressive with pyramids and domes and glinting in the sun and housing, you know, wives of the gen governors and people like that. But there were other tombs which tell a much sadder and uh, unpleasanter story. There was one tomb for all the writers of the East India Company, and they died so fast they were just shoved there, you know, without it being reprepared. There was another tomb, a very kacha sort of preparation, which swallowed up an entire generation. And in fact, there is a famous letter of this general who is writing to um, uh, he's writing to uh, the king, asking for more soldiers. And the king tells him, I'll send you a certain number of regiments. And he poo-poo's and he says, those many will not even satisfy Mendham's point for one month. So that was, in a sense, the life of the British who arrived. Many of them didn't even get a chance to lie, write a single letter home. And where is Mendham's point today? That was one of the great mysteries, because in the 1700s, Mendham's point was built over and more or less forgotten, except in these old texts. And then, in the early 1900s, construction began to take place um, around the around what is today the Director General's office. 
and had been built as the Alfred Siemens Rest. The Alfred Siemens Rest was taken over for various government uses. And in the early 1900s, there was digging to expand it and to increase its foundation. And at that point, the poor workmen freaked because as they were digging in that area, all they could find were bones and more bones and skulls and more skulls. And in absolute terror, they shed their instruments and they sort of panicked and ran away. And anyway, finally, they were prevailed upon to continue the work. But it seems that the mystery of the missing Mendham's point has been solved. And it sits here somewhere beneath this very familiar, rather, rather sweet, building in Palama. And um, maybe at this point, I'll just tell you a little bit about the story of the Alfred Siemens Rest was built actually for, uh, for sailors who wanted to come and uh, have uh, accommodation, you know, not very expensive accommodation here. And next time you pass Kolaba, please look at the triangular bit at the top of the Siemens Rest. It features a wonderful Neptune holding a trident and frolicking with mermaids and other sea creatures and it is quite one of I think one of the lovely surprises of our city. There were two other really famous tombs in Kolaba in the 1700s that Burnell and other people wrote about at great length. One of the tombs was one of the first governors of Bombay, an unfortunate fellow called uh, I think his name was John Child and he had a very bad time of it. He was forced to uh, uh, settle with the Siddhi uh, who had, of Janjira who had come and laid siege around Bombay. And then he was uh, uh, sort of uncovered as being extremely corrupt during the building of the St. Thomas Cathedral. He died in shame, or so they say. And he was buried in Kolaba under a huge white tomb, which was kept whitewashed. A little bit. This tomb is estimated to be where the Baptist church is around Kolaba post office. And a little way away, there was another huge tomb called the Moors tomb or the Musalman's tomb. One of many Muslim tombs and Sufi tombs in that area. And this tomb was also kept whitewashed. Now, and why were these two lonely tombs settled among rocks and mangroves so important? For a simple reason that while Bombay's harbour was absolutely wonderful, access to the harbour was extremely difficult, especially during the monsoons. And uh, prongs between the tip of Kolaba, sort of the tip of mainland, and prongs, what we have, where prongs lighthouse now stands, is a chain of rocks called prongs rocks. And these are extremely dangerous and the cause of innumerable shipwrecks over the years. And for the sailors to enter the harbour, at that point there was no lighthouse, so the tombs were extremely important and there are uh, intricate instructions about how the, the sailors had to angle their boats and themselves to enter the harbour. So as they entered, they had to keep uh, seven trees to the left of uh, John Child's tomb and uh, the, the Moor's tomb or the Musalman's tomb at a certain angle and then pray to whichever god they believed in and quickly try and enter the harbour. Even then, there, there are incredibly tragic stories of shipwrecks. And the most famous or infamous is the shipwreck of uh, the Castle Ray and the William Bentinck. And that happened in the 1800s, but I will just tell you about it at this point and uh, then move forward. Uh, what happened was uh, the William Bentinck had tried to, it was in June, the monsoon winds were already high, the William Bentinck was trying to enter the harbour. For two, three days it had been trying and uh, the sailors were obviously getting very impatient. And at one point they tried to enter and they slammed straight into the rocks at Prong's lighthouse. It was a terrible situation and the boat was slowly sinking. Night fell and the castle ray was approaching. They saw the lights of the William Bentinck and it was windy, it was squally, it was stormy. They assumed it was the lights of the harbour and with happy gratitude started sailing towards it and hit the rocks again. So both ships started to sink. The people in William Bentinck saw the castle ray and started swimming to that. Many drowned along the way. Some made it and then the castle ray sank. And so these poor people sank with it. 
and there is a there is a rather wonderful passage uh, very vivid describing the seas the next morning full of furniture and wood and uh, not such pleasant things like dismembered limbs and of course because the account is by the british who cannot write anything about india without throwing in a little romance of their the kind of romance they like there is a what there is an account of this nawab's daughter who stood i think on the castle rail pleading for somebody to save her and she said i am very rich my father is very rich i will marry whoever saves me and he can have my entire fortune and many greedy men tried to save her but perished in the process i think so did she and the story ends unhappily there was a huge tomb for the victims of this particular shipwreck at the kolaba cemetery which is uh, located somewhere where us club is now today the the cemetery is not there anymore but appears in a lot of old writing about kolaba uh anyway so what was the kolaba kolaba like around the 1800s in the late 1700s the army decided that kolaba was a good place for soldiers to go and recuperate so they started they built a few rough structures and soldiers a few regiments were sent there in rotation it was soon noticed that the air of kolaba and the life of kolaba was much healthier and uh, uh, a few top army top brass wrote to the government requesting that kolaba be handed over to the army because they said that uh, not only was it a healthier place but the men were encouraged to uh, you uh, indulge in more manly pursuits and their lifestyles were generally cleaner so at that point the, the army got their wishes and the the military and uh, the soldiers and sailors you say began to be housed in that area it was meant purely for military use but of course the hawa of our dear mumbai can turn many people and there is a story of the earliest encroacher of kolaba a gentleman named general waddington who sneakily decided to build a few houses all for himself in kolaba and uh, there was a huge court case but what waddington got his way and managed to sort of uh, take away a nice chunk of kolaba and a huge garden and a house went to his daughter a fairly famous lady named mrs huff mrs huff was a great beauty she danced with the duke of wellington when he came but more famous than her was her garden because it housed a mango tree which the british absolutely loved and every britisher who came here went to stare at it because this mango tree fruited not once but twice a year the second time of the year being during christmas so we were all very envious that mrs huff had masses of mango at her christmas dinner um just as an aside uh this is half's garden later was bought by the railways the railways uh, built the first kolaba station there after the first kolaba station was found to be uh, not so useful it was demolished and today the railway colony of badwar park stands there so when i was writing the book i actually ventured into badwar park to ask the maldives if there was still a mango tree that fruited twice a year um i have to say very sadly no, nobody could understand what i was talking about and they all thought i was like a truly batty uh, sort of customer and kept pointing out trees and saying wo people hai wo banyan tree hai and i had to return sadly unsuccessful from my quest but back to the kolaba of the 1800s the kolaba of the 1800s was an unsalubrious place all newspaper reports of that time were to do with jackals who had slunk into the room of the director of the kolaba observatory or snakes that had coiled themselves around the church organs or sharks that had been sighted in the waters or tigers that had been shot at the back bay um and it's one of my great regrets there is an absolutely wonderful account of a tiger swimming and trying to attack a boat and it, i feel very regretful that that happened near masgao and not in kolaba so i couldn't include it in my book but i can squeeze it into these lectures anyway so other than the wildlife there was wildlife of another time 
the wilderness as kolaba was then called was famous for uh, the outlaws that lurked there is a lovely story about a mrs paro who is going home from church and her poor coachman is shot in the ears by an armenian bandit on horseback and there is another absolutely startling story about a boat that is peacefully sailing around the waters of kolaba and uh, another boat approaches filled with what the british call maratha gallivants i'm not really sure what they mean but these maratha gallivants throw some flying burning missile at the boat manage to capsize the boat steal what they have to and all the poor people on the boat die i'm not sure how true this is but it pops up in many accounts there was an infamous gang of robbers called the bandar gang who used to sail around and rob steal from people who were using the ferries and in boats so uh, in general kolaba was a place to be avoided and ev even up to the point when in uh, the early 1800s the G the gigi boy agyari was built at afghan church the, uh, it was considered such an unsafe place that if any religious ceremony was happening at, at the agyari the women were warned don't wear any jewelry don't go after dark and i find it a wonderful wonderful sort of irony that life has come in a sense gone round and round and today at the afghan church of agyari you will see more jewelry than you will ever see in any other place at a go during naujot and weddings and uh, now in on in 1838 something huge happened that changed the nature of kolaba forever up to that point the only people who lived in kolaba were the military people and recluses who were really happy not to go to parties because if you went to a party in the mainland or if you went to a pub or to a restaurant and you were coming home there was every chance that the tides that sort of raced between uh, uh, bombay and old woman's island would come rushing in and you would not be able to go home or you would have to wait for the very rickety smelly ferry or there were many people who decided to risk it and actually drowned in the process and henry moses who is a former sheriff of bombay tells us this uh, i'm not sure how true it is but it is a rather delightful story about this uh, girl who is visiting relatives in kolaba she is on her way home and she sees the tide is rushing in but she is impatient to get home she's in a bullock gari so she tells her coachman to hurry and try and cross in any case the animals get rattled they get obstinate and they just start they just stand in the middle of the creek while the water is swirling the water comes rushing the gari capsizes the girl is flung into the water and carried to the back bay now we are really fortunate that a dashing englishman watching is see watching all of this he flings off his coat leaps into the water swims and rescues our maiden the maiden is supposed to be a mohammedan maiden at the beginning of the story somewhere in the middle of the story she turns into a hindu maiden but we will park that detail at the side predictably the dashing englishman and the beautiful maiden hindu slash mohammedan fall in love they meet secretly the englishman knows that his religion will cause a great obstacle but never mind he decides that he will brave the wrath of her parents and he asks for her hand in marriage predictably it is a sad ending the parents are furious they uh, the girl disappears hushed rumors suggest that she was murdered by her parents we are never sure the englishman commits suicide nobody knows what ha what happened to the coachman of the gari and the bullocks but in general this is a sad story in 1938 then for for everyone who lived in kolaba a huge change takes place and a huge change for the better uh, the causeway that links bombay to kolaba causeway is built and this slide this particular picture actually sh is showing the building of the causeway from one place to another and at that point it was just a tiny thing i mean the, the kind of construction that would not even merit 2 inches in the times of india it was a narrow sort of a road raised road that just linked the two bits of land 
but it transformed life in Kolaba. Property prices skyrocketed and suddenly greedy industrialists and rich people, rich sort of uh, landowners from around the city started eyeing Kolaba with great interest. Um, they uh, started buying huge chunks of land, not for their houses and their manors, unfortunately, because they were very happy in Mazgao and in Malabar Hill. They wanted land here for their factories. And they um, saw Kolaba for a long time in the early 1800s and the middle 1800s had become sort of the armpit, the industrial armpit of Bombay. It was a place of coal warehouses and paper mills and, uh, uh, you know, uh, loud factory noises and, uh, and also uh, a place where uh, soldiers who did not uh, obey the, the, the rules were punished. So it, it, it was a very gray and unpleasant place. It is an incredible fact, though, that Kolaba, for some unique reason, has always been very open to um, the winds of change from around the world. And it was a huge blast that, in a, in a sense, brought a change of fortune to Kolaba. Now, in the early 1800s, Bombay had a cotton green because Bombay was a major place of trading of cotton. This cotton green was at Horniman Circle. And, but Horniman Circle was the absolute heart of the city. And Times of India, the letters column in Times of India was full of irritable letters by letter writers who grumbled all these bales of cotton and people bargaining. My carriage was stuck for 45 minutes and I was late for my meeting. So finally, heeding the complaints, the, the authorities decided to shift the cotton green and they decided to shift the cotton green to Kolaba. Why Kolaba? Easy. A, open space, cheap, and B, very close to the port. Because in those days, the only reason that cotton came to Bombay was not for the mills. It was so that it could be sent to the hungry, greedy mills of England, of Britain, Lancashire, um, Birmingham. Those were the places the cotton was going to. So a cotton green was created in Bombay. The cotton green was 1.5 square miles. It started from the area that we now know as Electric House and extended all the way south towards Kola, what we now know uh, uh, towards Kolaba Bazaar, past, um, uh, you know, past uh, the area of Strand Cinema, the area of um, uh, beyond Kolaba Bazaar, even where the, uh, you know, the pasta lane stand. So it was an empty space filled with bales of cotton and a higgle piggle of warehouses. And uh, this is where, again, we have wonderful accounts and descriptions of the cotton green. It was a major tourist attraction in its times. And uh, everybody came to watch uh, the bargaining. And uh, there are lots of accounts, typically British, of course, of wily Indian tradesmen who could strike bargains. And no Britisher is ever equal to uh, to their uh, shenanigans. In 1861, something happened halfway across the world. In 1861, the American Civil War broke out and the Southern States of America signaled their uh, sort of, uh, their stand by burning millions of bales of cotton, millions of tons of cotton. What they were trying to tell the world is, support us or you will not get any cotton. The world chose to support the northern states instead. And had to, the British were frantic and famished for cotton. They, they had to seek an alternate source. And they decided to, to, they looked at Egypt and they looked at India. And all of a sudden, the cotton green of Bombay, Kolaba, became the place of huge financial transactions, of huge bargaining, of multi-million pound transactions. And it is estimated that over the four years that the American Civil War was being fought, 80 million pounds entered the city of Bombay. It was extraordinary wealth. And for a long time, it was assumed that Kolaba, 
would become sort of the commercial heart of the city. So if you can see this slide, you can see the cotton green and behind that you can see a building. That building is, today, is Grant's building. It was built as a sort of a Bandra Kurla complex of those times. And a lot of the big industrial houses and uh, trading houses bought offices here. Of course, as we know, um, history has a way of defying plans. And uh, today Grant's building is a, is a building filled with, um, has gone through many, many aftars, uh, has housed sailors' dormitories, has housed brothels, uh, now ha houses sort of bohemian and, bohemian and trendy uh, uh, workshops and shoe shops and after shops. And uh, it is very different from what it was built to be. But I love this picture because I think it gives us a great sense of the Kolaba that existed not just a hundred years ago. I mean, I'm not talking about ancient history. Anyway, the huge amount, I think, Kolaba's, uh, so this is another shot from the Kolaba uh, cotton green, and you can see the traders happily lounging and waiting for business. While this area looks very romantic, and it probably was very pretty, I must add an aside. Every account about the area talks about the bullock carts that jammed the streets because the cotton would come on uh, via the train all the way up to Kolaba station, which is now, which is at Bhagwar Park. Then it would be put into uh, bullock carts and brought to the cotton green. And then after the trains took place, again, it was piled up in uh, your bullock carts and taken to the ports. And every single person who has written about the cotton green grumbles about the how to say this politely, the little lumps of bulak potty that lines the road as the carts went up and down and about the damage that they always did to, to the fancy British footwear. Um, today, of course, this is the Kolaba station. It, and it's uh, just a very evocative picture. I, and amazing, you know, my grandfather often used to tell us stories about when he was a boy, he and his friends would suddenly on a lark, they all lived in Kolaba, would run to Kolaba station and hop into a train and carrying them to Surat. And the families would be freaking over here, wondering where the hell their sons had gone. And then would get like a sort of a trunk call at a neighbor's house from Surat saying, don't worry, we are fine, we will come back tomorrow. And I think nobody, none of them could have imagined that this structure so permanent and solid would one day just be gone gone so completely that if you walk in that stretch and ask people, do you know where the Palaba station was? People look at you like you are batty and generally sort of point you to Churchgate station. In a way, this is all that remains of the Palaba station. If you go into Badwar Park and go into the front lawn, there is this tree. It is, an, it is just a beloved, beautiful baobab tree. And um, the, the railways have put up this little sign saying this tree occupied a vantage point at the old Kolaba railway station. The tree remains after the station is gone. Trees are forever. And I, it's, it's just a very sweet sign, though I wish it hadn't been uh, sort of nailed onto the tree, but at least the tree remains. And it is, I think, one of the loveliest sort of memoir, mementos of past times. Now, what happened to all that money that was pouring into Kolaba? A lot of it went when the, the, when the cotton bubble burst because cotton prices had reached unrealistic levels and uh, the cotton hunger was so great in those days that people would literally go running to the cotton green and rip apart their mattresses and sell cotton from the mattresses. That was a kind of cotton hunger. And it was actually the birth of the coir mattress industry because you had to find other sources, cheaper sources for mattresses at that point. But a lot of the money... Six million pounds, it is estimated, went into making Kolaba and the rest of Bombay bigger, in short, reclamation. In those days, there wasn't so much awareness and people were very reclamation happy. So this back street of Kolaba is all reclaimed land. It came about because at some point it was decided that they needed bigger warehouses at the port near Apollo Bandar. 
So they said, Chalo, let's reclaim some land. And as we are reclaiming it anyway, let's reclaim an extra 43 acres. So that is what they did. And the entire area from Kolab, what we now know as Kolaba Causeway, up to Gateway of India at the promenade, and literally up to Radio Club is reclaimed land. When the land was reclaimed, a lot of canny businessmen, including Jamshedji Tata and many Maharajas and Nawabs from Gujarat, decided that this was a great time to invest in property. And they started erecting a series of really comfortable, um, large um, houses with you know high ceilings, huge windows, sea views, many of them, for uh, for the middle class British, because it was a new uh, type of Britisher who was entering India, was not part of the government, not part of the army or, or navy, but was here for trade. And in general, the, the more established Britishers looked down on these people, but they needed accommodation. So people like Jamshedji Tata thought this was a great time to build houses for them. What they didn't anticipate was that there was a growing middle class in the city that immediately moved into these houses and I think formed the backbone of the Kolaba that we now know because it was a real mix of people who came because they all had a common aim in mind. They all wanted biggish, comfortable houses uh, but could not afford the kind of mansions that the real money bags lived in. They arrived here and built their houses and because it was a mix of communities and uh, uh, professions and uh, you know, the sort of the ghetto system of the city completely broke down over here. The, the sort of the community-based housing of the city broke down in this area and in a sense laid the foundation for the Kolaba that we know. Um, this is another picture of Sergeant House, which is a building that plays an important role in my personal story, but I won't get into it here. But I will just say that this is where Dom Moraes lived and Leela Naidu lived and a lot of the jazz musicians of the 1930s lived. In the 18th, so as the money entered the city, uh, more and more, uh, you know, the construction that we now see today and love today in Kolaba started coming up. And this is a picture of Afghan church. Afghan church was built in the middle 1800s. It started in the early 1800s, the Protestant the community, the, the, the English church got really uh, a little uh, upset because the Roman Catholics had stolen a march over them and had built big churches everywhere. So they asked the government for money and the government was extremely conjuice and decided that they would give them some very specific amount, something like rupees 20,151 only. And these people got very uh, irritated and they set up a, like a makeshift church where without chairs. So Sunday worshippers actually had to carry their chairs. And it was such a ramshackle affair that the Bishop of Calcutta absolutely refused to consecrate it. But in the 1800s, uh, they started to build Afghan church. And I must say that all, you know, we associate, we tend to associate a lot of the handsome, beautiful construction around this area with the British, but largely they were funded by Indian philanthropists, many, many Parsi philanthropists and from other communities, but a lot of the money, 80, 90% was Indian. So, uh, so, you know, this to me also came as a huge surprise. Afghan church too was finally funded by a huge collection from the community and it was dedicated uh, to the people who died in the first Afghan war. And I don't know how familiar any of you are with that story, but very quickly I will go through that because I'm worried that we may be running out of time now. But uh, yeah, so Afghan church was, um, uh, the, the first Afghan war was fought because uh, the great game was in full, uh, at its heights at that point. The British became very, very insecure and thought that the Russians would try to invade India. So they decided to strike first and marched into Afghanistan, which was a very foolish move because Afghanistan has a reputation of being able to sort of overcome all, all those who try to grab it by force. Uh, the British uh, spent a lot of time sort of conspiring and involving themselves in sorties of different kinds and, you know, guerrilla warfare. And finally, after a number of years, decided it wasn't working. 
the higher ups, the authorities, the king at that point promised them safe passage. So about 4,500 soldiers and another maybe 15,000 or 20,000 women and camp followers set out from Kabul. And they uh, hit the, the Hindu Kush range. They entered a pass, which was five miles long and so uh, narrow that it is said that sunlight has never pierced it. At that point, the Gilzai tribal struck and it was an absolute bloodbath. Uh, only one officer and a handful of uh, 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 so soldiers, Indian soldiers survived. A lot of the women and children were killed. But a small handful were taken away, kidnapped and taken away to, uh, to the harems of these people. And there is a very famous painting, and I'm really so sad I actually should have shown it to you as a slide, of this single lone officer who survived sort of lurching into India. And uh, if you go into Afghanistan, if into the Afghan church, enter it and turn around, you will see a list of names of the officers who perished in that war. And it is extremely poignant because to me, Afghan church is one spot in the city, city which in a way traps the past. I'm, I'm not sure how it does it, but when you step in there, you really feel you are in a time uh, machine. Of course, there is one little irritating bit as well. The pity is that while they have commemorated their British officers, they never did bother to commemorate the Indian soldiers who also lost their lives as bravely. So the other story uh, that links with world history takes place in Sasundong. Even after, after the after the sort of the huge cotton boom in Bombay, many fortunes were lost, but they quickly got built again because of another stroke of fate for Bombay and another sort of uh, event that happened far away that was really good for Bombay and Kolaba. The Suez Canal was built. And overnight, the British realized that Bombay was a much more convenient port than Calcutta. The Sassoons built the first, uh, they, and what happened was the shipping traffic increased so much, there was a desperate need for, for ports and docks. And that is how Sassoon Dock was built by the Sassoons. Sassoon Dock soon stopped being a commercial port and it became a port only that, uh, that the British used for their, uh, for a military port. Now, one day, one of the boats brought along a man named Winston Churchill. Winston Churchill had associated himself with the regiment and he was here not exactly as a soldier, but attached to, uh, to a regiment. He was from a family that could sort of pull strings and he had managed to pull strings and uh, sort of uh, get his way and be a part soldier, part uh, journalist, a very odd and loose arrangement. He, his boat arrived at Sassoon Dock. And now Sassoon Dock um, has this strange sort of contraption. When you arrive at the dock and you're getting off the little boats that bring you from the ship to the dock, uh, there are these iron rings that you have to grab. So you wait for the sea to sort of swell and your boat to rise and then you grab the ring and quickly climb the steps. Churchill got his rhythm wrong and his arm was badly wrenched and he tore some muscles and he was really irritated about it. But it probably saved his life because very soon after that, he was part of a battle in Sudan, Sudan called the Battle of Omdur, Omdurzman, something like that. The British assumed that it would be a fighting these savages and we were not worried. They, most of them went only with swords. They didn't bother with guns. Churchill, because of his wounded arm, had to go with a gun. The battle turned into a bloodbath. A lot of British officers were killed. And but Churchill survived because of his gun. And so because of Sassoon Dock. And one truly wonders what world history would have been like if uh, matters had been different. And uh, Churchill had gone into that war with his sword instead of his uh, gun. In the 1900s, Kolaba sort of slowly started becoming the Kolaba we know. Um, construction, so till the late 1800s, the entire area that, that was between um, Apollo Bandar and the back bay was just flat land. There was nothing really in between. 
um, no barring maybe a few you know the warehouses and a random uh, conglomeration of uh, structures it, then at, in the late 1800s they built the alfred siemens you can see it here at the corner of, this is the alfred siemens rest and there is a beautiful passage in the bcci railway magazine saying that all travelers who came to Kolaba station had to stop and stare at this amazing huge structure rising before their eyes. And it sort of towered over the flat lands. And if you all see, you can just see how, em how empty everything around it is. So this is, uh, there's the Alfred Siemens home. And there is, uh, the, the building in the forefront is the Watson's Hotel. Uh, that is today uh, in a really dilapidated condition, but was at that point a really important and historical structure. Uh, Watson's Hotel is not officially part of Kolaba, but I, I cheated just this once and snuck it into my book because Mark Twain stayed at the Watson's Hotel and he has written this absolutely magical passage on the Bombay Crow. And I decided that the crows that must, must have perched in Watson's Hotel definitely flew around Kolaba and were as wily and cunning and, and sort of sneery in Kolaba as they were in Watson's Hotel. So I was entitled to this tiny bit of cheating. Um, many structures started coming up and slowly we, you, uh, we, could re we can recognize familiar friends. I don't know how many of you will recognize this as the original yacht club. The Yacht Club was the symbol of the British Raj in Bombay. It was the rendezvous of high fashion. It was the place where the main sahibs went, gathered in the lawns to have their evening tea and to complain about their foolish Indian servants. It was the place where the dances were held at night and where couples strolled at night in the lawns. And not all the couples that strolled there were married or at least not married to each other and the ships that passed were given strict instructions that they could not shine their spotlights on these lawns because it might cause a huge incident and nobody wanted that to happen. Uh, the Yacht Club was, of course, being as it was a symbol of British Raj, only Europeans were allowed to enter. And there is a story that uh, Shardan Dvivedi and Rahul Rotra wrote in their book that still has the power to make my blood boil. There was a Parsi gentleman married to a European wife and he decided to donate a billiard table to the Yacht Club. The Yacht Club happily accepted his billiard table, but the gentleman was never allowed to step into the club. So I would like you to imagine the scene in those days. The lawn was the home of many dances and it was a place where the bands used to play in the evenings. So many, many... Um, um, you know, many, many Indians in their carriages or on foot used to huddle at the gateway of, near, the, near where we have the gateway of India to watch the bands and the dancing while the British sort of had their fun. And in fact, uh, there is a little passage in my great grandmother's diary about the bands at Yacht Club and watching from the outside. And it always upsets me just a little. Um, the, what we now know as the Yacht Club was actually the Yacht Club Annex. And again, a very famous sort of structure because uh, it pops up in a lot of fiction uh, written in those times, uh, sort of fiction books written by the British, set in British India. And uh, many, many uh, husbands who had been thrown out of their house by angry wives had to bunk there for a couple of nights till the wife cooled down. So it pops up quite a lot. The, the important sort of the important ring of buildings around uh, Regal Cinema, where Regal Cinema is now also, came up around that time. So, uh, of course, the the fountain, the Regal Fountain or the Wellington Fountain, was the earliest structure in that area, and a bunch of others started being built there. Uh, the one to the left, the structure to the left, is the Majestic Hotel today, Sakari Bhandar and MLA Hostel. It was at that time a very fancy hotel run by Italian hoteliers. They were uh, sort of the franchise own owners over there and hosted a very, very famous jazz band. 
and uh, there are wonderful accounts of uh, you know where sakari bhandar is today it was a huge sort of a lobby where people with potted plants and newspapers and reclining chairs and filled with the traders who had come to trade at the cotton green and come to for, and would uh, sit in those uh, huge lounging chairs and take their siesta the building next to it the building to the right is waterloo mansion it is the only residential building in that circle of buildings and uh, waterloo mansion was so it was quite a prestigious address to have and it housed a number of fairly well known people but my favorite resident at waterloo mansion was a gentleman named mr jacobs mr jacobs owned a shop a sort of a curio shop in simla in shimla and he was a a man who attracted rumors and stories nobody knew much about him nobody knew if he was turkish or armenian or indian or polish or russian nobody even knew if he was uh, if a, if he truly had the magical powers that he was rumored to have whether he could uh, snap his fingers and start a fire whether he could walk really walk on water and whether he could control a ring of spies that extended up to the hindu kush what we do know is that he was an extremely wily customer and he had a lot of clients among the maharajas and uh, nizams of india now jacob mr jacobs read about this huge diamond that had been mined in south africa and he felt a little hungry and greedy he decided that he would be the one to sell that diamond and so he started grooming a customer the the nizam of hyderabad who was at that point the richest man in the world and an ardent collector of jewelry and curios so he told the nizam about this magnificent diamond and the nizam was very tempted and agreed to transfer 23 lakh rupees to uh, to the uh, to the bank in exchange for the diamond and then top it up once the diamond arrived and pay a total of some 50 lakh rupees something like that the first part of the transaction took place everything was going marvelously and it came for the time for the time approached for the nizam to meet his beloved diamond jacob laid out the diamond on a silver tray covered in red velvet he placed the diamond on it and he held it to the nizam the nizam took one look at it and in capricious nizami style said na pasand that was it the biggest jewel transaction of the world of that time collapsed with that with those two words there was a huge court case finally though he really didn't want it the jewel went to the nizam who was so disgusted and so revolted and repulsed by it for some reason that he wrapped it up in newspaper and shoved it into an old shoe and left it in a cupboard and it was years and years later that his son tried to put on that shoe and discover stumped its toe and discovered a diamond there not a diamond but one of the most valuable in the world the imperial diamond that stole or J- jacob's diamond poor mr jacobs was ruined and but he still had all his connections so one of his maharaja friends who had built wellington mansion uh, well uh, waterloo mansion uh, gave him a flat somewhere i think maybe two or three floors above where philips and philips sits today and uh, he continued till the end of his days hawking uh, uh, curios and lying about their uh, their parentage and their background to gullible uh, tourists on kolaba causeway and it is one of my great regrets that um, you know this happened way before my time but i really would have loved to have met him wandering kolaba causeway this of course we all know <laughs> a dear friend and uh, partly the host of this evening the museum and uh, i won't be as presumptuous as to go into the history of the museum because everybody here will know it better than me um so uh, the last uh, so uh, despite all the huge uh, and impressive uh, structures that had been built around Uh, some in the sort of gothic style and some in the indo saracenic style there was one blank spot one vacant spot around regal circle uh, around the circle 
which housed a cannon, which was used very occasionally, which was shot very occasionally to welcome dignitaries. At some point, it was agreed that that plot of land would be utilized, and Regal Theatre came up there. Uh, and I think is beloved to everyone who has grown up or has a connection with this area. And there are all these magnificent stories about Rabindranath Tagore reciting his poetry about Gregory Peck popping in to see how the audience, Indian audience was reacting to his movie about the soda fountain and the elevator that carried patrons up from the underground parking lot to the upper floor and uh, the champagne glasses in which the soft drinks were served. And uh, every time I read an article about how the future of Regal is uncertain, I feel a lump in my stomach and I really, really hope that Regal remains a friend of our, all of us. A little away in the sort of behind uh, the area of Regal Circle, uh, the Bombay Improvement Trust was parceling out plots of land. And the then uh, Archbishop of Bombay approached the Bombay Improvement Trust and said, our chapel at Fort is getting very crowded, it's very sweaty, it gets very smelly and noisy, and our worshippers are losing their religious energy. And we're getting very few worshippers, so we want to build a proper church. The Bombay Improvement Trust offered them a plot of land uh, near Electric House from the place where, where the horse-drawn carriages used to go at uh, the horse-drawn trams used to travel around Bombay. The Archbishop was incensed. He found the su suggestion, in his words, obnoxious, and he said that the noise and the smell of the horses would absolutely turn off his worshippers. So after much bargaining, he got a series of plots of land uh, where the church, the Woodhouse Cathedral stands today. And in the early 1900s, the Woodhouse Cathedral came up. It is, of course, one of the jewels of the area and uh, features the most beautiful frescoes, including a widow holding up the head, of, the decapitated head of her enemy and a dragon. And uh, for all of you who don't know, the bell of the Woodhouse Cathedral has a really sweet name. It is called Pauline. And every time I now hear it chime, the fact that it is called Pauline sort of makes me feel very um, affectionate towards it. Um, next to the cathedral and um, the school that stands next to the cathedral, Fort Convent was my school. And beyond that is one of Bombay's famous booth banglas, Sean House. Sean House also has a lovely history, has a history that in a way mimics the history of our city. So it was owned by a Mr. Setna. Mr. Setna gave it out on rent. And if you look at the Times of India directories of those days, you can see that it was inhabited, that a lot of the British middle class people who worked as dentists, who worked in the railways, lived there. Later, a German dentist came to live there. He was escaping. He had run away from Germany because... Uh, Germany had become very unfriendly towards the Jewish people. And he was living here and practicing from here till he was picked up by the British as an enemy national and put away in a camp during World War II. He vanished, never returned. And unfortunately, Sean House was never properly occupied after that. For years, my school, Fort Convent, used to run its junior classes from the ground floor but uh, unfortunately, litigation and, and I think just uh, the fact that it had become so decrepit uh, made that impossible. And now uh, tourists routinely walk past and look at it as a haunted house. But I have to confess, I spent four years, three, three years in uh, Sean House and I never once encountered a ghost, which makes me feel very irritated and grumpy. As the 1900s progressed, property in Kolaba became more and more expensive. Houses in Kolaba became more and more sought after. And the cotton green became more and more inconvenient. This was partly because the Bombay mills were now buying a lot of cotton. And the docks had moved. So what was the point of bringing the cotton all the way to Kolaba just to have it taken all the way north again to Parel and to the docks? Uh, that, so after it was decided that the cotton green should be uh, sort of scrapped and moved to Sibri, which it was. And 
after that point it was considered that there was there was no real reason to have the railway station coming all the way to kolaba and anyway they wanted to reclaim the land near back bay and the, the railway tracks were coming in the way so the railway so kolaba station was also scrapped and the entire area gradually became a place of more and more buildings and more and more houses largely art deco some were just boxy constructions put up in a hurry but again a place of middle class housing and the home of the wonderful jazz culture of the bombay of the 1930s so again there is a wonderful story uh, which my friend narish fernandez uh, led me to many of these buildings around kolaba were occupied by jazz musicians there was one musician a trumpeter who had come to bombay and he was inordinately fond of the booze he one day went tanked up and wandered around kolaba causeway and decided became very friendly with a snake charmer and bought a snake i think a python uh went home with the snake and then went to sleep with the snake right next to him his girlfriend ivy came and had a fit she screamed the roof down because what she saw was her boyfriend lying on the bed wrapped around by the snake which was sort of about a foot away from him just paralyzed and staring at the boyfriend it's very fortunate that the man had drunk so much that the alcohol in his breath paralyzed the snake ivy went running for her brother and his friends they managed to bundle up the snake and catch it in a bag which was extremely brave of them and then they gave it to the bombay zoo so presumably if we do go to our dita mata udyan we might encounter the snake's grandchildren but i haven't tried for that particular encounter uh slowly of course times were changing the war the world war 2 during world war 2 kolaba was the great party place of bombay um over the weekends they, all the soldiers used to come to the city for rest and recuperation and for a quick uh, sort of shopping spree especially uh, to buy porn and the archbishop actually issued a strong uh, dictate against porn sellers who were taking advantage of these poor men away from their home and families who and uh, sort of selling for porn and purveying uh, sinful uh, sinful products and uh, of course it was also a time of cabarets and uh, naughty ladies in the city but uh, so in world war 2 during world war 2 in kolaba causeway on weekend nights was shut completely and turned into an all night party uh, a pedestrian zone and people used to party on the pavements through the night it sounds quite glamorous and lovely but immediately after world war 2 something that was not glamorous or lovely but was probably much more important happened in kolaba and that was the naval uprising the indian soldiers uh, the indian sailors were extremely upset that during world war 2 and after while they had fought alongside their british counterparts they were still being treated badly their food was not at the same level their housing quarters were not at the same level and they were treated very rudely so they decided to rebel to 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 rise against the british it started on a very small scale with graffiti and posters a few men were arrested it turned very ugly they struck work many of the local unions in bombay the bus union the uh, mill union the railway union struck in support of the the sailors Three, there were wild riots around bombay 300 people died and the indian sailors actually managed to go and take control of a whole lot of ships in the harbor and train the guns on the, the yacht club on taj mahal hotel on the gateway of india so it's quite interesting to note that at every point history could have taken such a different turn at this point the indian national national congress stepped in and sort of uh, forced the sailors to back down um the entire incident is actually mentioned in the moors last side by uh, salman rushdie and uh, i carried the passage in my book because it's so interesting that his character is so in support of the sailors and so angry with the congress uh, it's also interesting that such an important incident so rarely appears in our school textbooks because in a sense it goes counter to our 
to our belief that our freedom movement, our struggle for independence was entirely non-violent. Um, I guess uh, there are exceptions at different stages of our history. Um, so this is the, the memorial to the, to the uprising, which stands, um, it stands opposite Bennett Villa and uh, close to the Woodhouse Gymkhana and Cooperage. So if you're like, ever passing there, do take a look. The next row, uh, moment in Kolaba's history, moment of glory, was when the British left India. They, they officially left India through the gate, gateway of India. And if you ever have time, there is a really charming and moving video on YouTube of the, of the soldiers marching, uh, everyone saluting each other, smiling, looking, I don't know, nostalgic, and walking under the, the arches, sitting in a boat and uh, sort of sailing away. So do take a look if you ever have time. Meanwhile, Kolaba has grown up to become more and more the place that we know. A really multicultural place that has never said no to anyone. When the Sindhis came to Bombay, one of the little Sindhs was established in Kolaba. Uh, and even today, you have Kailash Parvat, you have the buildings with the Sindhi. Uh, my, the building I live in today was built by a Sindhi refugee and was a largely Sindhi occupied building at one point, and many, many of our neighbors are. Um, it was also a mini, it is also still a mini Arabia, a place where the the Arabs come in the monsoons for their uh, for their little monsoon vacation, uh, and a place where uh, also a place full of Chinese restaurants, Chinese hairdressers, basically a mix and match of every bit of our country and every bit of the world, and uh, that in a sense is how that little straggle of uh, rocky islands, very unprepossessing, very unimpressive very unlikely to become anywhere great has become the Kolaba, the colorful, happy, vibrant Kolaba that we know so well. Okay. So uh, I will, um, at this point, I would like to uh, say that, I mean, I am done and if any of you have questions, I'd be very happy to answer them.